Hello, and welcome to our presentation. We're very glad that you've uh, chosen to join us today. I'm, my name is Brian Carpenter. I'm the Curator of Indigenous Materials at the American Philosophical Society Library and Museum. I'm presenting today with my colleague, Dr. Patricia Anderson of the Tunica Language Project. Our project uh, centers around a, a project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation Dynamic Language Infrastructure Program. Um, it is entitled the APS Indigenous Languages Manuscript Interface. As you can see from our dates, we just very recently started. We had, have had some uh, uh, adaptations due to COVID conditions as many people have. So we're glad to share here the conception of the project and its early stages. Uh, this is a partnership between the APS library, which is located in Philadelphia in Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape people. And we want to acknowledge their continued presence and relationships to the land. Uh, and it is partnership also with the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana, specifically their language and cultural revitalization program. For those unfamiliar with the APS and why it, it's placed here, it is a, one of the major repositories in the United States or in North America of archival materials related to indigenous cultures, language, and history. And the Tunica Biloxi tribe is the uh, tribal nation uh, directly connected to the archival materials that are at the center of this project. Those materials are uh, a set of notebooks created in the 1930s that are housed at the APS library. They were recorded by the linguist Mary Haas with Mr. Sostri Uchidant, who you see pictured here, who was the last known fluent speaker of the Tunica language. They recorded a vast amount of documentation. It's the largest body of documentation ever created of the Tunica language, but not the only one. And it is extraordinarily rich in detailed, very easy to use with a great diversity of information from stories, cultural information, great deal of linguistic uh, information as well and information beyond language information uh, as well. And although, public, although Haas published a great deal of, of Tunica um, grammar, dictionary, and texts, there's a very large body of material in these notebooks that was unpublished and has not yet been fully utilized. One of the big center outcomes of the project is to create a full transcription and transliteration of, of all of the content, English and Tunica, in the notebooks. Patricia will deal with that detail that shortly. Uh, the idea is to then use that to use that text as a way to be integrated back into the APS digital library where these materials are digitized and available to use that uh, uh, transcription and transliteration as a way of making the notebooks easier to use and navigate. Uh, from that, that also allows a basis for us collaborative, collaboratively to create a community curated interpretive resource which will give context and guidance on the uh, importance and uh, use of the uh, materials. Uh, Patricia will say a bit about that as well. And then as broader impacts for the APS as well as that this overall uh, interface as we're calling it will then be applicable to lots of other language materials and similar archival resources. Some other themes that uh, motivate the project as well is that um, this is specifically focused on manuscript materials. There is an extraordinarily large body of manuscript documentation of in indigenous languages in archives such as the APS. Um, and these are extraordinarily valuable. I think this audience will uh, implicitly know why these materials are so important and useful. Um, uh, and they're very heavily sought as the archivist for the collections here at the APS. These are the these field notebooks, especially, are the kinds of things that are most often requested because the the most core materials. But and we are able to now in the, in this era create better access through digitization. But that doesn't necessarily significantly make things more usable. So this project is to um, uh, tries to tackle that problem. It also isn't considers the fact that there have been many projects of this kind uh, done in the past that have uh, transcribed and published things in books, but often those kinds of uh, the knowledge created from those projects don't necessarily get folded back into the original archival context. So how can we as archivists, linguists, uh, native communities, and people who cross all of those lines uh, find projects that can collaborate together to create a mutually beneficial project of this kind? Um, we think this is, this is our shot at that, and now Patricia will uh, 
give some insights onto how things are going so far. Thank you, Brian. So as mentioned, uh, the Tunica, this project is being done in collaboration with an ongoing Tunica revitalization effort. That effort started back in 2010. And we largely started with the published materials that Brian mentioned, uh, grammars and dictionaries and the like. Took us a little while to find the unpublished ones, but once we did, um, you know, we've been working with and collaborating with the APS since 2013 to get PDF copies of notebooks, uh, visit the archives, et cetera. And uh, so we've effectively had access to at least, you know, PDFs since 2013 for eight years. Um, but we're a small group, a core group of language revitalizationists, and uh, we're really busy. We've got a lot of other projects that we're doing, right? You know, immersion workshops, creating pedagogical materials, updating grammars. We've got a ton of projects, and dealing with these notebooks is really time intensive. Um, so while we've had them available, we haven't really delved into them that much. And instead, we just kind of use them when we have some extra free time. Um, and so, Brian, if you can go to the next slide. When we do deal with them, we find some really interesting stuff. Um, and so I love this first example here. Um, and the, the second entry, the hey me, to greet, is something that Haas had in her published materials. But the sentence above it, which talks about shaking hands, and that is a word tapi hey me, she doesn't have published anywhere. And someone was flipping through the notebooks in the group and you know had some extra time and said, wait, wait, didn't, didn't someone ask us how to say handshake like a few months or maybe that was a year ago? Well, hey, look, I found it. Um, and so we know this information is valuable. We just couldn't get it in real time. Um, but that's, you know, the things that stand out are the things that we've probably spent the most time with. Uh, pages with illustrations on them, we've probably read more often than pages without, just because they stand out. But we know there's a ton of information in here that we haven't gotten a chance to really uh, grapple with. And so next slide. And, you know, we, so we started talking with APS, you know, we said, we, we know we're not the only group that is dealing with PDF handwritten manuscripts. Like, how can we make these more useful? Uh, you know, are there other ideas that other groups have had? Or if not, how could we make this searchable and useful to our group? Um, so searchability was something we talked about. Uh, also, just how do then we, uh, you know, host that, make it available to Tunica speakers and learners and even researchers uh, that outside of the group as the Tunica um, Language Revi and Cultural Revitalization Project is very proud to do. Um, and so, you know, where do we host it? Uh, and then if we do put it out there, you know, now that we think about it, we want to give it context because we don't, these, the tunica that is in these notebooks has changed, uh, now revitalized tunica and the way it's spoken now is different. And so if we do want this out here as a really cool, searchable, usable resource, we want to give it context and place it in that, um, in the history of revitalization and then the current of how speakers speak tunica now. Um, so next slide, please. So we created a pilot project of actually transcribing and typing up uh, the uh, few pages of the notebook just to prove that that we could do it, that it would work technologically, and then also figure out you know how many people we would need, how long will it take. Um, so we got a time mm -hmm. estimate and actually took that XML output and uh, passed it on to APS, and they. Um, use that output to kind of create a proof of concept. Again, just make sure the technology that, that we as a group are already working with, that we could do this project within it. Um, and it did show that we could use our current software um, and that it could, it, it could uh, be done. Um, so from there, we've moved beyond the pilot and we are currently in the first stage of the project. Next slide, please. So the, the, this first stage, the stage we're currently in is uh, transcribing um, the notebooks and then also updating it into contemporary tunica orthography. And I'll, that will be our next slide. Uh, but for this transcription, uh, worked with um, the Tunica Lang LCRP to co write the announcement. They advertised the announcement. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, the, the recruitment was explicitly open to folks who did not have experience in the language. We wanted people uh, who were interested in Tunica or who had heard about the revitalization project but hadn't had time to get involved, that this could be another opportunity if, uh, to, to look at the language 
and copy the letters uh, as you see them on the page. So you didn't need Tunica experience to do this. Um, once we got our transcribers, we did training. The software that we have long used in the Tunica language project is the uh, Fieldworks Language Explorer by SIL or Flex. Uh, so we did um, train some transcribers who were new to the, to the software on it. We're using it in a very limited context for this uh, project. So that was very doable. Um, we uh, you know, trained on how we're gonna do the work. We still have ongoing sessions. So we meet once a month to talk about some idiosyncrasies in the handwriting or you know, so-and-so saw a, a weird punctuation mark. Is that actual punctuation or did the pen just slip? What do you all think? So uh, we continue to have those ongoing discussions. And this uh, kind of training set out that we allow our transcribers to work on their own schedule, at uh, their own pace. Um, and then when they finish with their section, uh, they we, we have, a, have we, I have it all set up so I get notified automatically and I proofread that and then provide uh, feedback. Now that we've been doing this for a few months, uh, I would say, uh, the transcribers that we have, whether they have a lot of experience in Tunica or this is their first exposure to Tunica, um, they've all become really consistent with it and it, they're really going along at a good clip. Um, so we're getting that first stage done there. Um, and the next stage, slide please, is the transliteration. So this is, we wanted, you know, we wanted to create something that sure you could search in Haas's Tunica notation, but if you're learning or speaking Tunica today, you don't write like that. Uh, not only might you use different letters of the alphabet, but through revitalization, we've changed a number of things like um, making words more morphologically complete or um, standardizing grammar across a few places in the language. And so the transliteration is actually to put that into contemporary Tunica. You can see on the screen on the left, the top line in black that says word, that's the Haas Tunica. And if you go down, there's one either at the middle of the page or the very bottom of the page where it says free, and that is the updated Tunica. This is done by folks who have a lot of Tunica experience. It's actually um, led by our master teachers. And they, um, so they do know all the goings on about uh, the changes in Tunica and um, have been doing that. So yeah, next slide. So um, I will be glad to discuss this more in the Q&A, but the, to briefly address the technical aspect uh, here on the APS side at this stage, uh, Flex um, creates an various options for exporting the transcription and transliteration as XML. We are, we are then transforming that into TEI XML, or, which is used a standard encoding language uh, schema for marking up um, textual materials for digital resources such as this. So that we're then integrating that into our digital library where our developer is um, creating an open source module that will be added into our repository, uh, which is an Islandora-based repository. And then uh, we'll be sharing the documentation of how we do that mapping and the uh, coding for the module itself as part of the final documentation of the project. All right, so that is the first phase of the project, creating this baseline in the two forms of uh, Tunica, which means we can, you know, we can do some basic searching in multiple Tunica forms. But the question is, you know, how do we even grow this more to be even more useful? And so that brings us to the next phase. Slide, please. So there's a number of components to this next phase. Uh, one of them is adding metadata to the text to make it more usefully searchable. Um, so not just keyword searching, but tag searching. Uh, one thing that's already come up as a request is searching by semantic domain. And we are going to do that not only in English, so you could search for animal for, per se and, and see various references to animal, um, but also search Uma, the Tunica word, and get that same result set. We want to make a resource that isn't just English centric and that you can interact with it in Tunica as much as you would like to. Uh, we will be continuing to running workshops with the community and language revitalization project to see what other search features would be helpful from a pedagogical standpoint or from a learning standpoint as well. Um, and we hope to run those in Louisiana. We'll see uh, what, what happens this year. Um, but notwithstanding, we will still be doing a lot of community generated content as well for a variety of different um, 
stories and grammar and whatnot that appears in Haas, putting that in larger context. The one I think I'm most excited about is, you know, really highlighting the contemporary practices, whether they align or differ from the descriptions in the notebook. So for example, some of the descriptions of stickball still really hold true to some of the, the ways that Tunica plays stickball today. Um, some of the medicinal plant descriptions, on the other hand, some of them are still similar and some of them are different. And so really putting that in context so that you can learn Learn not just about tunica and the linguistic um, features that were spoken, you know, 60 plus years ago. Uh, in addition to this uh, larger cultural and historical context, we're putting uh, it into a linguistic context as well, calling out uh, areas of the notebook that bring on to play really interesting features of tunica grammar, such as uh, feminine gender being a default in the language, um, as well as some inter interlinear analysis. So these things we're really kind of taking note of now as we are transcribing and transliterating the master teachers and myself and other folks working on it are kind of making notes of things that would be really cool to go back in and expand on and put into a larger context. So at the end of our year one of our project, at the end of this coming summer, we will have uh, the initial version of the site to uh, premiere for people where this data will be viewable in parallel and matched up with the original uh, scans of the manuscripts. Uh, and then the year two portion, as Patricia's just described, will be involved adding in this uh, community co-curation um, for which discussions, uh, we'll have a variety of structured discussions. Um, the, then this will then become a broader portal for an introduction and guidance on um, the usage of an understanding of the Tunica language materials um, as uh, guided by the Tunica uh, Biloxi tribe itself and the language learning community especially. This will also be, we will then be adapting this to other um, uh, similar sets of material at the APS library as well in collaboration with the many communities that we work with. The data will also be downloadable, the flex data, as well as probably the TEI XML as well to help encourage other people who may want to um, utilize this data for research in the language or to construct similar projects. Broader applications of how we're gonna use this portal at the APS, the system is um, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of uh, materials at the APS uh, digitized notebooks that we're working on. We've actually identified uh, a very large slate of other similar kind of field notebook materials that would be digitized for which uh, us archivists will be adding in navigation information such as tables of contents, uh, names of speakers, and information that is very often present in these notebooks but is not brought to the surface in existing cataloging. And these will then be used not just to make things more findable, but also as navigational tools for being able to find materials in the notebooks. We have found from doing that kind of work in the past uh, with other materials and some of our other collection guides that really enhances the findability of the materials, um, especially for indigenous communities uh, who are, are the primary, uh, the majority of the requests we get for materials at the APS are from indigenous communities themselves. So it helps to fulfill the needs of that primary audience and uh, to uh, help make things, things more usable as well. We also find, see potential in being able to utilize past transcriptions of similar materials of this kind, as well as future projects that may be uh, come together around such materials. Um, so we hope that having the, uh, this project in its final form will help, you gen help generate ideas for other people who may want to do similar projects. Uh, native communities will not be required to use this portal to uh, curate materials at the APS, but it will hopefully demonstrate some options for possible ways to do that. Um, so part of our documentation will just be to find ways to uh, uh, show how this material, uh, transcriptions and other commentary um, that's in other forms can be transformed into TEI XML. And uh, we're looking forward to demonstrating various ways that can be done. Uh, when we get to the Q&A session, we'd be glad to answer more questions about how this tool compares to other tools that are out there in terms of navigation, uh, use of data, and so forth. We have some thoughts on that and imagine people may want to um, ask about that, as well as other questions. But for now, uh, we're nearing our time. So we'd most like to say uh, thank you for taking the time to view our presentation. 
And uh, we hope to be able to meet again in the future in person. And we look forward to sharing uh, more of the results of our project as we uh, go through and complete all the future steps. So thank you very much. Thank you.